orbiting 250 miles above, the space station provides us with the ultimate view of planet Earth. From this perspective, we ask our guests to engage with six questions that orbit around wonder and stories of hopefulness. For the next few minutes, this is, is our wonder space. space. Welcome to the 103rd episode of the Wonder Space podcast, which is an expression of a family trust called Panapa. My name is Steve Cole, and since September 2020, I have asked the same six questions to over 100 people from around the world. People like Amy Clark from Tribe Capital, who powerfully talked about Berta Isabel Flores. She was a human rights and environmental activist from Honduras, who was murdered in March 2016, protesting the construction of a dam on sacred indigenous land. Amy reminds us that Berta is one of many people from around the world who put themselves in harm's way in the defence of what is right. We are thrilled once again to be drawing from the wonder of Ask Nature, who look to nature for inspiration to solve design problems in a regenerative way. Here is another moment to help us re-wonder. Female animals across the tree of life have evolved adaptations that protect them from diseases that claim the lives of millions of women every year. Pushing against the barriers between veterinary and human medicine, some researchers are now forging a new species-spanning approach to health that recognizes other animals as a powerful source of life-saving insights for humans. Giraffes thrive with high blood pressure. Deer delay embryo development until the timing is right Marmots spend months in hibernation and experience no loss of bone density. The result is that those who study and work with other female animals hold knowledge that could yield major breakthroughs in healthcare and wellness management for women. How much can we learn when we listen to the sisterhood of species? This week on Wonder Space, we orbit with Simon Lamb who is a freelance writer, photographer, and coach. He has also been given 20 acres of the family farm as a test bed in the pursuit of nutrient-rich soil, which he talks about in his story of hopefulness. With this expansive overview of Earth, I start by asking Simon, if we could do a fly past over any part of the world that is significant to you, which place, city, or country would it be and why? Yeah, obviously lots came came to mind for this, but I'm going to take us, I think, over the Pyrenees and over Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port, which is a small settlement in the Pyrenees, which in itself is um, a place of amazing beauty, you know, crystal clear water that you can bathe in and this incredible like mountain energy that you get and the kind of chinking bells of um, the mountain cattle. And it's just a great place of calm, but... I'm choosing it because it's also the start of the Camino de Santiago, so um, which is um, yeah a series of old pilgrim routes which run through kind of the heart of Spain and kind of congregate in Santiago de Compostela and the French way, which the original way, um, which um, starts in Saint Jean. The, these pilgrims have been going there for thousands of years, and when you sit in this place, you get a real sense of that of this kind of following in um, the footsteps of of your ancestors. And each year about 300,000 people become pilgrims and they'll congregate to, to start their journey, lots of them in Saint-Jean. And um, there's this kind of nervous energy and this excitement that, that, that sits in the city and also this sense that everyone is kind of walking for their own reasons. So um, there's a Latin phrase that I love, which is, Solvata Ambulando, which means it is solved by walking. And I think um, along the Camino, a lot of people are coming to kind of solve something in, in themselves and, um, and I, you know, ask a question of, of, um, of why they walk. And, and for me, I think that my journey, which started there, was kind of I walked a thousand kilometers across Spain and it really was a kind of journey back to myself because living with my life on my back and walking west, I felt kind of 
as free and um, as kind of light and also as kind of connected um, as I've ever felt, really. Simon, give us a glimpse into your life story so far with an emphasis on what you're doing currently. When I think of my life story and inherently, when I go back to the beginning, I think of the woods, really. I was really fortunate to grow up on this farm in in Wiltshire in um, South England and uh, large swathes of our farm is, is forest and woodland and those woods then by default became an extension and a kind of canvas for my imagination really and I think the best lives or the most interesting lives don't really go in straight lines, they go in lots of different directions and and um yeah, I think through my, through my adolescence, another very shaping factor was going to an, a boarding school, an all boys boarding school. So you go from this environment on the farm where um, you felt incredibly kind of isolated, and that was the extension extent of my world, really, in in many ways, to an environment of um, kind of Lord of the Flies, where you have to learn to survive. And lots, of, and it's been interesting as I've kind of grown older to see a lot of the defence strategies that obviously came into place into an environment like that. And now you're going to be shaped by your adolescence in lots of different ways. And as you come out of that system, um, there was just a kind of set path for a you know a middle-class boy like me who went to a school like that. You then went you know to university and then you got a job in one of a cer- certain number of fields and at some point um you chose to get married and have two and a half children and and move to a slightly lethier place and all those things are brilliant and are working for in so many ways for many people I know but at some point I had this kind of moment of realization that I was in the best paid job I'd had I was writing speeches for um the execs of a big corporate and people are like wow wow and I had an, an amazing girlfriend in my life but I fundamentally had not even come close to asking any of the questions of who I was and I was at a point where a lot of people were seemingly making lifelong commitments to an identity and um I just had this crushing realization and it came in the form of depression and anxiety for the first time in a really heavy way I think um yeah, for, for, for me, I just suddenly had, had this moment like, wow, okay, I need to make some changes. I wasn't quite sure how, and I definitely didn't know what. And actually in the kind of five years since then, it's been this grappling for identity. It was for a long period, a kind of dark night of the soul, which is when you have, you know, total absence of God or whatever you call, um, you know, this kind of higher force in your life for a period. And that's what the dark night of the soul is. And for me, that was big because, I'd fallen out um, kind of with the church that I'd grown up with and I was pushing, moving away from my family and I was kind of separating myself physically from a lot of friends. I was living in Amsterdam and um, I had absolutely no connection with my spirit or that kind of that part of me. And um, yeah, in that it was just a big, big... um, beginnings of a wrestling for identity that has not been linear even in the five years but it's been kind of um I think leading me probably to this conversation today and to to where I am in many ways Deepak Chopra who's who's um a kind of um super interesting guy who I read some of his teachings he asks three questions and he says who am I um what do I want and how can I serve? And and those three questions I hadn't really ever asked because I hadn't needed to up to that point. And that what can I serve was a big part for me and is kind of the calling that's taken me into coaching, which is the identity I'm trying to begin to adopt today because I've realised that um, helping others feels like a fundamental um, calling for me and, and coaching felt like a nice fit because a lot of these lessons and a lot of this, like, wisdom that comes through some of these quite painful experiences um could could kind of find a home there and and um and equally with my writing I've been a you know I'd say a a writer a copywriter for most of my career is that was always um an outlet for me and traditionally as I mentioned I've I was a ghostwriter so I was writing for other people and I'm beginning to try and write in my own name which coincides with the adoption of this identity and kind of doubling back to the start 
those lessons in the woods really is informing everything I do because I think as a coach, my main thing is that reconnection between us and, and our nature and the natural world. So um, it's a movable feast, but um, it's been an interesting and probably the most challenging um, one of my life. Where on earth is your place of reset or recharge? I kind of toyed with the mountains versus the woods, but landed at the, the sea. Um, I think because I, I love the, the oceans come into my life in adulthood more than in my childhood. And I, I think in the ocean, I find um, I like the fact that it's a piece of the natural world that can't be controlled. It won't yield to, you know, we can, humans will damage it in many different ways, but we fundamentally can't control it. And, um, and there's kind of parallels between the sea and also my, my journey with my emotions with my mental health with depression. I, I begin to think of them like a wave, you know, there's a definite starting point and an end point. And the same also with any feelings of, um, joy and excitement. I've kind of been practicing more that, um, slight detachment from that, knowing that all of them rise and go. And that's part of the experience. And, with the ocean, I, I just love that, the connection between the ocean and the moon as well, that it controls the tides. And I just think there's so much to wonder there. And then kind of just um, in the in the horizon as well of the sea, that that, that is limitless, you know, where, wherever you're at in life, if you look at the horizon of the ocean, like a kind of wild grey ocean like that is, and, and suddenly you, you realise everything is possible. Um, so yeah, that, that, that place has always has been. And over the last several years, I've been walking the Southwest Coast Path, which is 630 miles, the longest single path in the UK. And I just dropped back in, dropped back out to do sections of it when I need exactly this, when I need a little moment of reset, either on my own or to invite a friend into the magic of walking by the sea. So that's exactly where I turn. What wonder of the natural world excites you the most? This one is the the body, actually, the human body. For, firstly, because I think we forget that we are exactly that. We're totally part of the natural world. We came from, we'll come from it, and all of us in some way will kind of return to it when we die. And um, and in the body, I think, yeah, for, for 30 years, I didn't really realise that I had this incredible tool that's 100% reliable and... Um, and totally free. And um, I think when I retrospectively look back, all the unhappiest periods of my life have been when I've been ignoring the intuition that exists in my body. And I was introduced to it through a kind of a week long um, personal development treat called, uh, retreat called The Path of Love, which kind of took a week of pretty um, significant work to travel six inches from your brain to your body. And I suddenly realised, oh yeah, my brain is a wonderful tool, but quite unreliable. And certainly for me, it's unreliable. But my body never, ever lies to me. And if if you ignore it, um, on the whole, I find you'll go down the wrong trajectory for you. For you. And if you manage to begin to tune in and listen to it, then, then it's great and it's really rich and it's totally free. Simon, what is your story of hopefulness that's not your own, about a person, business or non-profit who are doing amazing things for the world? I grappled with this one, as lots of people would, and on the whole, my instinct is always to go to a human story because I find that just the most compelling, really, and that's something I do in my writing is try and tell human stories, and those stories are always cut through my defence strategies, whatever it may be, um, particularly the stories of love, any blind spots I have on that, and it cuts straight through. But for me, I'm actually going to go for perhaps the most important um, story of hope for humanity at the moment, and, and I'm going to choose the worm, actually. The worms are the most remarkable thing, and they're probably, as I say, our biggest source of hope because there's this enormous... Um, soil crisis that's going on all around the world that I've only really begun to learn a little bit of recently and obviously a lot of people have had this realization long before me um and um and and the worm is an amazing answer to that I was I was reading recently that Charles Darwin at the end of his life he began became fascinated by worms and he he would gather them in his home and he would play music to them he'd shine lights on them and he'd feed them little bits of onion and cabbage he knew there was something in the worms and his final piece of work was about how you know worms can kind of turn vegetable mold um the formation of vegetable mold through the acts of worms and he watched there was a flint field behind his house 
covered in flints with some flints kind of the size of a kid's head. And across 30 years that he lived there in Kent, it became the most perfect and that nutrient rich soil. And so, you know, he had this um, kind of test bed that, that was informing him. And um, yeah, and obviously, you know, the, the worms are these amazing tiny little plows. They aerate the soil. They pull everything in those flints the size of children's heads and they can kind of process it and excrete it back in to form these soils. And, you know, I talked about running through the woods earlier and the, whenever you put your hand into the soil in the woods, it's unbelievably rich and incredible and very noticeable to an untrained eye like myself. And this realization that the way we farmed and the farmed our land at home for certainly since my grandfather bought the farm in the 1950s is, is kind of has about 50 years more of a life cycle. And, and that will be, then we'll own a desert, which won't be that valuable. And so, um, yeah, I've been kind of banging on about this to my, my father for a while now. And he's agreed to, to give me one field. So I have 20 acres as of the end of this harvest. So in about August to begin to work with and, and to kind of give it back to, to the worms. And I think I, I like that idea because a lot of what informs me is that ultimately if we get out the way of the natural world, um, it tends to know what it's doing and it never hurries, but it accomplishes pretty much everything. Finally, as we prepare to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, what insight, wisdom or question would you like to leave with us? On the homepage of my website, uh, there's, there's just one line which sits atop the top of the ocean for reasons I explain, but... It comes from the old Mohawk prayer and the, the Mohawks are an indigenous community of North America and a little bit in Canada who uh, still rely, you know, completely on um, the natural world. And so they've not lost that connection between nature and human nature and the natural world. And so they have this prayer that they say at the birth of each child, they kiss them on the forehead and it's a longer prayer but it has the line thank you earth you know the way and um i love that sentiment because it, you know in in kind of everything i've spoken about today that the intuition that exists in in the body and then our connection with the natural world i spoke earlier about the camino how many people on the camino came up and because i did this series where i did 30 uh, portraits and ask them why they walk and again and again people were saying oh you won't believe this happened to me or you won't believe this happened to me and it's purely because in that world people were looking up and engaging and suddenly all these wonderful moments of serendipity were coming in and of course you know for a lot of people who maybe have a religious faith it, it is channeled through that but you you don't even need that you just need a faith in 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 the universe and in the earth and and the the mohawk community have never really lost that and whenever i've lost that in periods of my life they've always been periods of feelings of disconnection disconnection to my body and also to what i really want to be doing and and um i'm kind of um yeah, in, in love with that, that premise of, of letting the earth guide you. You can find out more at simonjlam.com. What is your story of hopefulness that's not your own? About a person, business or non-profit who are doing amazing things for the world? We would love you to consider recording yourself in under 30 seconds, sharing your story on your phone through your video or the voice recorder app. You can then simply upload the recording to the link on our website, ourwonder.space, and we will look to include them in future episodes. I want to thank Simon for joining us on Wonder Space. Let's continue to share our stories of hopefulness that makes a name for someone else. We need them like never before. Thanks for listening.